Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Regarding Men with Paul Elam, Janice Fiamengo, and myself, Tom Golden. And today we're going to talk about something that has a lot of angles to it. Uh, it's a sad situation where Carolyn Flack, um, a, uh, she was the host of a program called Love Island in Great Britain, which apparently was really, really popular. And it was, uh, Love Island was about having, I think, four couples come in to the island and people would vote then on which couple was the cutest and the couple that got the least votes would be out for that week or something like that. So it's one of those reality show kinds of things. Something very profound. I'm telling you, <laughs> she, was, she was a beloved host of that. People loved this woman, apparently. And uh, she was pretty talented from what I've been able to see. Uh, but there happened uh, December the 12th, I think, at 5.25 a.m., a, a fellow named um, Lewis Burton, who's 27 years old, who was her boyfriend, called the police and said that he had been assaulted by Miss Flack in his sleep. And apparently what came out later was she hit him with a lamp in the head. So not good. The police came, they came to the place and they found both were bloodied. She had blood all over apparently with a cut to her wrist, which she said was there when she cut herself on a wine glass. I've heard that one before. At any rate, um, so she's bloodied. He's bloodied, and she apparently admits to some sort of connection with the, with the incident, but I'm not sure exactly what, but the police had police camps on at the time. They recorded this whole thing, uh, their interaction with both of them, and they charged her with domestic assault, okay? And since that time, that was December, I think in, you know, in the past couple of weeks, um, the guy, the boyfriend said, oh, no, 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 it was all a mistake. You know, this is, let's, let's just forget the whole thing. And the cop said, no, 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 we're not going to forget the whole thing. And so the whole time the media is tearing her up, right? I mean, they, mm -hmm. the media is saying really nasty things like, this is not Carolyn Flack, this is Carolyn Smack. <laughs> and, and another company put out this, uh, or it was a, a newspaper put out a Valentine of, um, I'm going to fucking lamp you, you know, for, it's like mm. just nasty, typical nasty media stuff. Yeah. And apparently Miss Flack uh, was pretty affected by this kind of thing. And she told the police, apparently, she told the police, if this goes to court, I'm going to commit suicide. Now that brings up an interesting question in itself. What do you do, you know, if you're the police and someone says they're going to commit suicide, if you if you follow through on what you know you need to do? I mean, that's one question we can have a look at today, but there's more questions than that. You know, and one of the ones I find particularly interesting is that with domestic violence, um, let me read you a quote from this article. Data showed that intimate partner abuse played a role in 2031 male and 439 female suicides across all age groups. That's from the CDC, apparently. Mm. Hmm. So domestic abuse is involved in suicide. Now, I kind of knew that part. But the part I didn't know was that domestic abuse is involved in suicides such that people who are the perpetrators suicide more often than people who are the victims. Isn't that interesting? And this holds true for both men and women. And so, <laughs> what the heck? I mean, in some ways, it could be expected that she would commit suicide if she was indeed the perpetrator. I think the men's uh, percentage is 4% of the domestic suicides um, I'm sorry, let me, let me read you the actual quote. That'll make it better. Although occurring in only, this is from the CDC. Although occurring only in a limited percentage of cases, being a perpetrator of interpersonal violence in the month before the death, the month before the death, was more common among male suicide decedents, 4%, than being a victim of such violence, 0.3%. Whereas the proportions were similar for females, and for females it was 1.4%, 
uh, were the perpetrators and 1.1% were the victims. Mm -hmm. So that's another interesting piece of this is if the police are going to start changing their ways, they really need to start thinking about the males who are the perpetrators as far as suicide goes. Mm -hmm. But of course, we all know that gynocentrism is, play, is rearing its ugly head with all of this. Mm -hmm. And it's saying, oh, poor Caroline. You know, they, they juiced her up for <laughs> a month and now everyone's going, oh, poor thing. But guess what? You know, we've got this gorgeous genetic treasure, right? Who is apparently a perpetrator and I think that creates cognitive dissonance in people. They don't know what to do with that. They have no idea what to do with it. And so what do they do? They find a way to make her the victim. So of course, she's the victim of those nasty police who charged her even though the boyfriend said, that's bullshit. But guess what? That's been going on in the United States for how many, you know, for decades. Is A, mandatory arrest, and B, even if the victim says, no, it was all a mistake, mm -hmm. they prosecute anyway. So in some ways, I think they're getting a taste of the medicine that the men in this culture have been eating for the last 10 or 15 years. You know, so what do you guys think about all this? It's, it's a fascinating mess, and it has a lot to do with men and, and what we are about. What do you guys think? Well, I, I think that, um, one, it's interesting to me, and I, it makes me wonder, had this woman been a man, would we have even seen it in the news? No. Right. Or would there be a discussion? I know that the police were taking extra precautions with their investigation in this, trying to cover their asses in this, as though they're worried about being culpable. And of course, if a man had committed suicide, the police wouldn't give a damn about covering their asses. Exactly. They wouldn't need to. The the really the only thing that this story does for me is it provides an, a, an example of the difference in reaction when the sex changes in, in any given situation. Yes. Uh, I went through, for instance, her suicide note. One, I want to say, obviously, and I think with Tom, with the, with the statistics that you cited, we don't really have a causal relationship between domestic violence and suicide. We've got right. it's certainly a, a correlation, correlation. To, yeah. to some degree, yeah. but nothing approaching a causal relationship. And, and I would think that a lot of these are already, you know, mentally challenged people, emotionally challenged people going through mm -hmm. hard times. I read through Ms. Flack's suicide note and it reeked of a personality disorder to me. It was absolutely zero accountability. Uh, saying on one hand, I'm sorry, but it was an accident. Well, we don't apologize for accidents. <laughs> Um, accident that lamp hit his head. Yeah, it accidentally hit his head. And she also turned the situation, even in her suicide note, to make her the victim. Yes. That yes. This, this was an accident and um, I'm ruined now. And yeah. I, I get that. I mean, I think with some more emotional stability, she would have recognized that this, this particular society would have eventually forgiven her. I mean, look at, at Hope. What, what was her name? The, the Hope Solo. Hope Solo. Commits domestic violence and she ends up lionized uh, and it, in positions of authority. There wasn't the destruction. This woman overly dramatized this whole thing. It looked like certainly there was some um, emotional upheaval in the relationship that she was having with a, a guy that was 13 years her junior. Um, but I'm looking at this now and what I see is, okay, um, we had a domestic violence situation and this woman, as opposed to a, uh, Tom read the numbers, if we want to talk about people committing suicide, if it is in relation to that, it's much more overwhelmingly male, but of course, yes. There's no news stories uh, about that. So mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. here we are discussing her. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Well, it, it it does raise all those issues that you've both articulated so eloquently. Uh, there, here's the law of unintended consequences. Uh, at one point, I was reading an article that mentioned that the uh, former Crown Prosecution Service uh, chief prosecutor 
stated that the CPS was under pressure to pursue convictions for domestic violence right. amid, amid concerns that too many prosecutions were dropped. That's well, right. gee, I wonder who was putting all that pressure on the CPS to keep pursuing these prosecutions, even when in, in cases where the alleged victim said, please don't go ahead with it, you know, let's just drop it. And they still do with these, I think they call it evidence led prosecutions. Well, we know who's doing it. It's the feminist MPs, it's the feminist barristers, the very people who are now coming forward to say that this is a terrible tragedy that Carolyn Flack was led to take her life. And exactly. so, yes, this has been going on and, and uh, you know, our, our wonderful friend, William Collins, has a fantastic um, uh, post on his Empathy Gap website yeah. that I encourage everybody to read, where he talks about how this has overwhelmingly affected men, that he's done a study of false allegations, mostly having to do with sexual assault and the number of men, there's a couple of women too, a mother of a falsely accused man, the number of men who have committed suicide or in fact been killed in homicides as a result of false allegations. So these are cases where the men were clearly innocent, but he said even in cases where it seems likely that the accused was guilty, yes, suicide is quite prevalent. He found a higher percentage than the ones that, that you found from the CDC, Tom. I think he found uh, 8%, something like that. Um, so, you know, and, and so this is a real issue. He also found that it seems as if perhaps the correlation or causation works the other way too, that suicidal ideation may actually play a role in causing domestic violence as you know, well as the other way around. Oh. So if we're concerned about all of these issues, if we are genuinely concerned about suicide and domestic violence, we should be concerned with, with depression and anxiety and mental illness in both men and women. But the fact is that we're only concerned, it seems, when it's a, when it's a woman. Who ends up dead? He he exactly. has he he found you know he did investigation mainly over the last um, I think since 2013, and he he found 16 cases of men ending up dead as a result of false allegations wow. and how much you know how much public brouhaha and worry was there over that and did the Charlotte Proudmans of the world stand up and say that it was a terrible thing that these people were shamed and demonized in the press and had their lives destroyed. No, they didn't. So you heard nothing. Yeah. So so certainly this is an issue that affects men and that doesn't get talked about or or, or worried about very much at all. Yes. It does also raise the, the question about the appetite of the Crown to pursue or or indeed, you know, in the United States of of prosecution uh, chief prosecutors to pursue these cases when they they really don't seem to be cases that uh, you know, that, that anybody necessarily needs to have pursued. Uh, why is it? You know, is this really the, the, the best way to go? I don't know what you guys think about this, but I mean, I, I posted this on Twitter in relation to the Carolyn Flat case, and I got a lot of um, pushback wow. about it. And I know it's a really uh, kind of controversial thing to say uh, that I really don't think that a lot of cases of domestic violence are usefully criminalized at all and i know that's difficult because where do you draw the line obviously there are very serious cases that need to be criminalized and what would be the the effect of of decriminalizing domestic violence but um you know lives destroyed for for what is there another way that this problem in families and especially amongst couples can can be dealt with that doesn't involve ruining yes. people's lives in this way Amen. I think there is. Uh, absolutely. I mean, I'll, I'll go ahead and say it. I think that domestic violence that doesn't re result in uh, life-threatening injuries, if, if we're talking about minor injuries, bruises, scrapes, that sort of thing, I would decriminalize all of it and keep the state out of people's relationships. I never understood why we thought if a husband and wife we do know, for the most part, when couples get physical, it's mutual. That's mm -hmm. what it is. That's right. the typical case. Right. And how can you expect to go in with state functionaries 
and manage a relationship. If something is nuanced and complicated between two people and intervene in that relationship criminally and expect anything but bad things to come. Mm -hmm. we, we saw this all the time, you know, um, in Houston, or way back in the day, Warren Moon, our, our great star quarterback of the Houston Oilers, was accused of domestic violence. His wife wanted to drop the whole thing. They said they had a fight. It, nobody was really hurt. It wasn't a big deal. The neighbors got involved and the police got involved. And guess what? They said, too bad, lady. We're prosecuting him. Um, and it's not just feminists. It's prosecutors right. that know that the instinct in human beings to protect women is so great that they'll be seen as heroes yeah. for going after. If you go mm -hmm. after and persecute a guy because he lost his temper one day, then you're going to end up um, in Belford back, backs called it mock heroics. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what we're talking about here. Um, there are things that mediators and therapists could do to help people resolve conflict if we could get them into that. And, and maybe the courts could be used to force people into to say, look, you're going to have to take a look at your relationship, what's happening here and get some qualified counseling. Of course, then you get into another problem with feminists, but that, yeah. that's for another day. Mm -hmm. um, but still, this idea that we just go in and arrest somebody and, and frequently take the breadwinner out of the home and, and lock them up in jail, then they lose their job. Then the kids don't have a, an income. I mean, this way have a father. Stuff is crazy. I would decriminalize all of it. And we do know when things cross a line. That's why we have aggravated charges on people who commit assault versus simple assault. Uh, when bones are broken, when serious damage is done, when weapons are used, we do have legal lines to draw between people. And while they're not perfect, it's a whole lot better than just a default position of finding somebody to arrest and somebody's life to destroy because a couple had a fight. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, I mean, this certainly in this case, I, we don't know what happened, uh, you know, to hit somebody over the head when he was sleeping, if indeed that's what happened with a, with a lamp, you know, sounds like it could have caused quite serious bodily harm. In this case, though, it didn't. So it makes me wonder whether, you know, I don't know, can, it, can you accidentally hit somebody over the head with a lamp while he's sleeping? Well, I don't know. It sounds like they were both Oops. pretty drunk. Yes, uh, you know, I he was he was hollering as he was led away, you know, something about I was normal before I took up with her, uh, <laughs> you know, hollering that at the neighbors. <laughs> so perhaps what he reported to police about what happened was not actually what happened. He ended up with a very small scratch on his head, if, if the, the photographs that I've seen were correct. Photographs did circulate about a very bloody bed you know, it made it look like a pretty gruesome crime scene, but now it's understood that that was her blood right. from right. a self-inflicted wound, it seems, this cut well, on her it was wrist. An accident. She accidentally broke a wine glass and it cut her wrist. It cut her wrist, yeah, you know. <laughs> so, I mean, this was, this was a sad, you know, really messed up situation. Yeah, I don't, you know, I don't know. That doesn't necessarily mean that, that, that she shouldn't be held to account, certainly for, for what she did, but it sounded like you know, both were involved in, in a, a very you know, drunk and messed up encounter and that to, to prosecute yes. her, I, don't, I just don't see. You know, so much of domestic violence that we, that we read about, it involves shoving and you know, slapping mutual kind of getting into it because you're just, because you are drunk or, or you're at the end of a horrific argument or whatever and uh, locking people up and putting them through this doesn't seem a helpful way of dealing with it at all, whether it's a male perpetrator or a female perpetrator. And yeah. Uh, and we've had 30 years of villainizing the men and victimizing yep. the women. Mm -hmm. And it's getting old. Yeah. Yeah. You know, for those of you who are younger, there was a day in the 1980s when domestic violence problems were pretty much handled by family therapists, you know, and there was this big struggle between the feminists and the family therapists, in the, I guess it was the 80s, mm -hmm. and the feminists won, and they yeah. pushed all the therapists and all the family therapists out of the arena of domestic violence and took it over with this crazy Duluth crap. 
and that's the beginning of mm -hmm. the story. Yeah. Oh. From that point forward, I, and I know this because I watched it happen. From that yeah. point forward, family therapists started modifying their ideology in order to have access to this market. Huh. You, you, you saw them going hook, line, and sinker for Duluth style. <laughs> Uh, so oh, yes, they became born again feminists <laughs> when the money started drying up. And yeah. all of therapy did, you know. Yep. I mean, yeah. not all, but the a vast lot. majority. Might as well be all. Yeah, really. Yeah. You can't find a male friendly therapist anymore. Yeah. You know? An another one of the consequences of, of this incident has been that uh, something like 500,000, perhaps more people now, have signed various petitions, one of them called Carolyn's Law, I think very vaguely worded, but it was something to do with the media, you know, not becoming involved, not harassing, demeaning, you know, over publicizing these kinds of cases mm. before they actually go to court. And, uh, you know, yeah, here's another really interesting wow, what an issue. idea. <laughs> what a yeah, what an idea. idea. <laughs> and would that apply yeah. to me too? Well, that's the thing, you know, do they want this to, to apply to, to the Harvey Weinsteins of the world? Are we to, to protect him from, oh, well, he, we've just lear learned that he's been convicted of uh, those, some of those charges. I haven't read the details now. So, you know, or, or a Jeffrey Epstein, you know, I, I don't know, actually, you know, I, I have, um, I, I'm kind of stuck on this one because I believe in freedom of expression uh, and, and people being able to learn what's going on. But at the same time, we all know that especially with accusations of domestic violence and sexual harassment or sexual assault, the consequences are immediate and devastating, yeah. usually for men. So yes. I think there should be some kind of shielding of the identities. I mean, I don't know how it could ever be done, really. Um, but well, but they, uh, they shield the identities of alleged victims. That's what I was going to say. Yeah, really. Why not? Yeah, the that, well, that's true. Yeah, the alleged that's true. perpetrators. Mm -hmm. You know. Yeah, until at least after after the conviction. The, the conviction. Yeah. If someone gets convicted, all bets are off. You know. Tom, are you suggesting that? <laughs> People be treated as innocent until they're proven guilty. Yeah. Damn, I wouldn't admit to that, Paul. Yeah, what <laughs> world do you Pretty radical. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It has mm -hmm. become a radical idea. It's just mm -hmm. unbelievable. It's like, what are people thinking? Believe the woman. Believe yeah. the victim. Mm -hmm. This is like crazy talk. This is literally insane. Yeah, yeah. And as, <sighs> as William Collins' research shows, believe the woman leads directly to dead men. Yes. Yes, exactly. Exactly right. Yeah. No. Um. But but you know I don't know. I yeah. It's a, it is a radical proposal. Uh, many of the Me Too cases, of course, do not involve criminal charges at all. They just involve women coming forward with various kinds of allegations and the the you know almost immediate destruction of the man's reputation and career as a result. Um. Uh, you know, of I don't course, know. to get a conviction, they roll some expert in to tell you that oh women commonly have long-term relationships with their mm -hmm. rapists. Exactly. <laughs> That's really pretty normal reaction to being raped. Mm -hmm. yeah, translated, whatever these women did after they were, quote, raped, that's normal. That's normal. <laughs> <laughs> so you can oh, convict yeah. him. Oh, yeah, well, God. you know, we now have, yeah, we now have expert witnesses like this Barbara Ziv, oh, who can... Geez claim on the witness stand with a straight face that there is not a single thing that a woman might do that would, could be used as evidence that she was not raped. <laughs> so, you know, yeah, it, uh, I guess- You cannot you know, win. You yeah, cannot win against these people. If people are willing to buy that, coupled with the, you know, the, as we say, the ever-present gynocentrism uh, that, that sees women as without agency, then um, yeah, it, it's it's pretty bad news for men. I mean, I, I've been noticing this over the last year or so in cases where mothers kill their children and how frequently the newspaper articles present the whole thing as a tragedy 
including right. the, you know, and often the, the mother, well, in some cases she kills herself afterwards. Um, in other cases she hasn't, but often, you know, the emphasis is on her victimization, whether she's alive or dead, what has, what happened to her that brought her to this point, what might've been done to help her so that this wouldn't have happened, you know, in a, a kind of discourse, it's never used when a man kills his partner and his right. children or, or yes. his, his children. And just recently there was one at Christmas time, a, a woman who, um, I, I I think she jumped off a large um, parking garage in Boston with her two children. Ooh. And um, yeah, horrible on Christmas day, if I'm oh, remembering yeah, correctly, or perhaps the day after, I, I, I'm, I'm not sure. But, uh, and all the reporting uh, went um, out of its way to avoid seeing what was obvious that she either pushed or pulled her children off that building with her. Some witnesses were reported as saying they heard the screams of the children right before they were pulled or pushed off the building. Oh. And yet I, all of the articles talked about them falling from right. the building. Right. They could not bring themselves to say that the mother had caused this to happen to her children. And that it was over and over again, the discourse was this was a tragedy, a terrible tragedy. For this family the fact the father was the one left grieving it was almost not mentioned oh, at all geez. so yeah it you know we are up against such very powerful cultural forces yes it's called you know, and there's another guess. case right now in australia where yes. a man set his family afire yeah in, totally in a car horrible. yeah and but what's interesting after this tragedy and it, these things are tragedies and um what's interesting though is that uh, one of the police uh, officials, liaisons to the public that was having a press conference after that, said that they didn't know if this guy was just an enraged lunatic, uh, if he was full of hate or what, or if he was a guy that had been pushed to the edge. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and of course, this guy, whatever the equivalent in uh, Australia of Siberia there is, that's where they've sent him. Mm -hmm. Immediately. Well, Pauline Hansen, a politician in Australia, comes out and says the same thing. And now she's under fire mm -hmm. in the media. And it's like this mentality all across the board for domestic violence cases is that we're just not allowed when the male is the perpetrator of anything to start looking at what happened. Right. 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 And uh, if and it's Female's the perpetrator. We don't look there either. We just have to go with the narrative that she was mental health issues, some sort of, of problems for her. And if the, only the world could have understood, this tragedy could have been avoided. Mm -hmm. And with men, they flip the script. And then w whatever it is, if men weren't such pigs, this tragedy could have been avoided. And that's mm -hmm. what happens in every one of these cases. Yes. Yeah, if the woman yeah. is the perpetrator, everyone tries to find a way to make her into a victim. Mm -hmm. yep. And it's obvious what's going on here. It's moral typecasting. And the work yeah. of Tanya Reynolds is instrumental in understanding how this works. And that is, generally, people see men as agentic and being able to take care of things. And when you see people in that way, guess what? You automatically give them less compassion and understanding. Mm -hmm. yeah. you know? And if people, are, women, quote, in general, are seen more as having what they call patiency or victim likelihood, mm -hmm. you see them as deserving more compassion. And that's culture wide. You know, this moral typecasting thing is just kicking our butt, you know? Yeah, yeah. It's Ugh. not helping to solve these problems. That's no, it's sure. not. If anything, and, we're, we're aggravating these problems instead mm -hmm. of really addressing them. Yep. Well, sure, if you're a woman and you know that you can get away with all sorts of bad behavior by claiming to be a victim, that's got to have some effect on you. you. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure that out. And that's why they can say Johnny Depp's wife said, no one will believe you. Mm -hmm. She knew exactly. the she culture knew. was well, going, yeah. <clears throat> you don't have to be a smart woman to figure that out. No, you don't. <laughs> Little girls of six years old on the, on the schoolyard already know it. I can hit you and you can't hit me back. Exactly. Yeah, Boy, there's a so. couple of times I really wish I could have decked her. You know, oh, just yeah. one punch. Talk about power and privilege. <laughs> Alice, yeah. Alice, mm -hmm. what did he say? 
what did he say on the on the motors? Oh, to the moon. To the moon, Alice. Moon, Alice. <laughs> Alice. Right to the moon, Alice. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh God. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, I can only hope, but I mean, it's a very thin hope that the Carolyn Flack case might, I mean, to draw this, wrench this back to that, you know, um, you know maybe, ah, I mean, I don't, I don't even believe that. I was going to say maybe there could be, you know, some kind of productive discussion about what it means to be the accused, especially if you're a well-known accused uh, whose name is just, you know, dragged through the mud and then you you're the on the receiving end of mockery and disdain and everything else maybe some of that might be applied to to male accused too but i just can't believe it i can't believe that if that had been a male accused who killed himself that there would now be all these tributes pouring in and all of the flowers and all sorts of people like piers morgan standing up and saying you know how what a tragedy it was i just i can't see it unfortunately would have been different, no question. One thing's for sure, because of this unusual story of a woman being the perpetrator and the woman committing suicide, which is so much out of the narrative, absolutely nothing will change. <laughs> what a positive there message. <laughs> we always end on a positive note we here. We do, we do indeed. <laughs> all righty, well. Oh, God. I guess we all should just end. go away, at least with the understanding that we're all fucked. <laughs> <laughs> and, but, have, and, but have a good day anyway oh. yeah <laughs> men are good <laughs> very good we did it <laughs> we did it y'all take care okay we'll Love see you have a great week bye bye